welcome to Field Sports Britain. This week we're at the Aston Martin or Caterham of gun factories, Browning in Belgium. We'll be revealing the absolute latest in technology that the world's biggest manufacturer of handmade guns has to offer. At the Claygrand, at fox shooting and stalking, and here in the Holy of Holies, the Browning Custom Shop. So how did a Mormon gun maker from the USA, John Moses Browning, end up here in a factory that makes everything from milking machines to motorbikes? Well, here's a quick potted history. Browning designed the most famous guns of the 19th century, the Winchester 1892, the Colt 45 automatic pistol. In 1902, he patented a new gun, the Auto 5. He offered it to Winchester. They already had a pump-action shotgun, so he came here to Fabrique Nationale. A historic relationship began, and a great global brand. This is a military establishment. Not many come through these doors. One Browning official complained to us even his dad isn't allowed in. No. But for one lucky Brit, his dream comes true. He has come here to see his Browning B25 being made. I've come to see my gun in the Browning factory. I've met the guy who fitted the wood and I've also met the guy who's done the engraving. He was retiring this year, they tell me. So, quite possibly one of his last pieces. And this is the top of his art? Well, I think so. <laughs> I think so. They're just, no, they're just beautiful, aren't they? They're absolutely lovely. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, you could have gone, you know, and got the same thing stamped out in Italy or something, couldn't you? Yeah, well, never been a, a Beretta fan, which <laughs> mm. ever. I've always, always been with the, the Miracle mm. roundings, always. And what kind of shooting are you going to do with it? Everything. So you're not just going to look at it, sort of leave it in the cabinet, look at it at home? No, 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 this one, no. Um, I have another one which I use all the time, or I've, I've started to use all the time, and this will replace that one. And it'll be good. Shoot all my sporting, shoot game with it. Fabulous game guns. Um, so it'll just do everything. Brilliant. Are you allowed to put it down now? Can I? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to take it home with me. Yeah. <laughs> if, if that's at all possible. They've got to finish it first. It can take up to two years for your gun to be built. With so many craftsmen at work on it, Andy Norris of Browning explains how they keep track of each handmade component. Tell me about boxes. These boxes, each gun or each pair of guns or trio of guns, as it goes through the production, stays together. So you've got to remember this is a hand-built gun. So the top lever off this gun is fitted to that particular gun. So it won't even fit the other gun of the same pair, so you've got all, let alone anything else. In there, so it? all the bits stay contained within these robust boxes all the way around the whole process. So when they, they finish stocking or they finish anything, this you can see here is a pair of guns for, well it's York guns, it's a pair of 30 inch game guns. So they're probably ready for some lucky customer sometime this season. Um, here you can see a, a four end iron yep, for it. that particular gun. You'll <laughs> see the serial number matches that. Yeah. Next time I see this will be in Yorkshire, won't it? Yes. <laughs> Going bang. Or hopefully in a field. Yes. Being used for its, the purpose it's intended to be used for. And they, they said this box will go from here to the engravers. To the engravers, the to the stocker, to the, the bluing process, the whole thing. It stays together all the way around. Well, that's really cute. Once upon a time, all Brownings were made here. With the machine built guns now made in Japan, Browning's factory in the great gun making city of Liège is now a centre of gun craftsmanship. Here's how it works. So what would normally happen is the consumer has gone into this dealer and uh, he's decided that he would like to buy uh, a B25. Normally the dealer then either goes through the products that he has already on order or uh, on the shelf, or if the consumer is looking for something that's really handmade, then uh, usually we, we try to get them, uh, we invite them over with the dealer and we go through the entire manufacturing process with them. We will uh, take the measurements to have the stock fitted to them. They can choose the engraving, they can choose uh, the stock dimensions, they come and choose the wood themselves. Obviously the, the, the technical features, long length of barrel, calibre, size of top rib, choking, 
These are these are all things that, that uh, it's a blank canvas. You you, you, can, you can pretty much mix and match. Well, I mean, do many people choose similar lengths of barrels and shapes? The most common would be a 30 inch, 12 ball with a game rib with a six mil top rib, uh, probably choked quarter three quarter, or quarter and a half. So that's your pheasant shooter who likes a bit of clay and a bit of pigeon. Yeah, that, that would be uh, typically. Uh, one thing we have noticed in, the, in certainly in the UK over the last two or three years is a, is a trend towards 32 inch, 32 inch guns. A lot of a lot of guys doing high pheasant, so uh, which uh, we, we try to cater for. So. And then woods. Where do you get your wood from? Because that's always taken very seriously. <laughs> it is because our volumes are very small. We, we only buy, as, a, as I say, around 200 blanks a year, 200, 250 blanks a year. So we tend to work with someone that goes prospecting for us. The majority of it comes from Turkey so or there's Azerbaijan. A, there's a guy who kind of cruises the markets of Uzbekistan <laughs> and Azerbaijan looking for wood for you. Not specifically for us. What a great job. <laughs> it, it is. It's not specifically for us, but uh, we have a, a, an agreement with him where he's looking to buy grade grade one, two and three. But if he comes across high grade wood, he buys it and then uh, sends me photos and we go down and have a look at it. So if somebody finds a walnut tree up on the mountain, does the whole village come out and celebrate? <laughs> is that how it works? Uh, <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> anyway, the point is the game is not back here, which is lovely. Okay. There's a drying process as well, and oh, okay. uh, uh, but it has been known. So let's take a look at that room full of wonderful, exotic woods. Thank you. So this is World of Wood, Andy. Where, where are we exactly? Yep, this is our climate-controlled area where we store all our wood that has been par-finished. Let's say par-finished, we've gone through the selection of... T um, picking the timber we want. We've then had it um, profiled, which will then relieve, uh, that will then show any uh, weaknesses in the stock right. before the Is client it picks it as a blank. It breaks there, doesn't it? Well, you could break anyway. You can get all sorts of defects. Once a client, if a client's choosing from a, a blank of wood, yeah. a stock blank, you don't know what's inside there. No. So once the uh, stocker starts to work on it, yep. all of a sudden you can find a flaw, that piece of timber is useless. Yep. So what we do to eliminate that process is we profile most of these out, which, which is a great, it's a great time-saving um, machine we use, yep. and it'll also find most of the, the faults Those we have in the, in the timber. And you've got these, these are four ends, are they? Are they these four these four are all parts of three-piece four ends. Oh, they are four ends? Yep. Right. They will be part of the three-piece four end. And this is all beautiful. Here, that. again, we've, we've cut out the pieces for the concealed butt plate. It's like chocolate, you could eat it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and this is a fully made up single piece of wood fall end, isn't it? No, that is just yeah. a roughed out piece. It's roughed out one. Yeah. Okay. You'd have to inlet for all the, um, the fall end iron. There's probably 10, 20 hours more work to go in there. And here's, I mean, that's, that's, more, that's a little bit more finished, that one, isn't it? Yep, yeah, that's a stock that's just there to show people what it could look like. Ah, Herr Kettner gets this one, yeah? Yeah. That would probably be for a rifle he's chosen. Yes. Um, and the tricky bit, as far as somebody buying a gun is concerned, is choosing a really good piece of wood. Because you always hear this, I've got a really good piece of wood. What, what is a good yep. piece of wood? A good piece of wood is really in the eye of the beholder. I could come here and say, Charlie, trust me, I'll pick you a lovely piece of timber. Come here. Take something like that, I think that's fantastic. Yeah. Suits Charlie down to the T. Finish the gun and you go, oh, I don't like that. And you could come here, pick something that I don't like, and you'll think it's the best piece of wood you've ever seen. So it really is down to personal preference. So that's why we offer the client the opportunity if he's coming here for a bespoke rifle or shotgun yes. to come into this area, choose his own wood. So we have we grade the wood. There's one over here. Yeah, right? we choose we, we grade the wood in B grade, C grade, D, yep. and exhibition. So what we have here, once the client has, has seen a piece of timber, i.e. this here for a B grade gun, it's gone, yep. oh, I quite like the look of that. So that's got big yep. black lines across yep. there. That's the roots. And up, all it? we'll do is take a simple sponge and some water, add that to the stock, wow. and it'll really transform that from a dry, lifeless piece of wood 
and give you some sort of indication of what the wood would be like when it's finished. It Obviously, it's still rough. It hasn't been, um, has had no oil, hasn't been checkered, no. but it'll give you a better indication. You see, I really like this one, which is sort of gnarly. Well, this here is exhibition grade. This will come from a much higher altitude, uh, more desert-like um, surfaces. So therefore, it hasn't got a lot of soil. Oh, so this has really struggled to grow. With, with the, the walnut, it all comes from the root of the walnut and the first limb. If it's got a nice soft ground, it'll grow fast and you'll end up with big, open, flowing grains. If it comes from a rocky, mountainous area, sort of high altitude, yeah. the, the roots can't expand like they can on soft ground. So therefore, they're forcing them, themselves together, getting all tight, and then you'll get this nice, knotty, burly piece. You'll take the felt tip off. Yeah, we'll take the felt tip off. But again, this is a stock blank. It could look stunning now. We could then start to work on that, take it down, and find inside as a natural floor. Oh, really? It is a natural material. God, it's like cutting diamonds. It is. It is a natural floor. A piece of wood like that could cost £3,000. Really? You take a chance, you start to cut in, it could have hollow points in there, which you can't fill. You can't do anything with. Happy little beetle going, hello. You just don't know <laughs> what's in there. So that's why we actually employ experts to go around the world and choose our wood for us, and we will buy batches from various outsources. I love this. I, this is like a sort of sporting version of you know, a terrorist arms bazaar on the border of Kazakhstan. You've got it it is very, country. very similar. We will send someone out there, and there'll be literally a corrugated shed on the side of a mountain, and he will say, this is the material we've got. We'll inspect it. Um, do various tests that they do to make sure um, see what sort of moisture content it's got and if they think it's it's good enough and the right price we'll buy it and it's going to be expensive out there so it is very very expensive because it, it is a, a real commodity and it's it's we're using it faster than we can grow it so it could mean school books for the local school or medicines for the local hospital or that kind of thing to a community to have a bit of walnut like that it would certainly bring an awful lot of money into small villages that wouldn't be there oh, otherwise yeah. Yeah. let's leave all this beautiful craftsmanship because what's the point if you can't go shooting with it this evening we're using the new browning x bolt rifles roebuck and foxes are on the menu and in the two shooting hot seats are andy and the boss of browning damien kevers um, beautiful beautiful early may evening in um, belgium and courtesy of Damien Kivers, CEO of Browning, a special invitation to go and stalk with Christian, his gamekeeper. Uh, we're going to go and try our luck, see if we can find a, a young roebuck. We're not looking for a good established roebuck. We're going to let him sow his seeds in this coming rut. We're just looking for last year's young, which this time of year now been expelled from the family, i.e. the mother is now getting pre preparing herself to drop this year's fawns so she'll cast off last year's young. And that's what we're going looking for this evening. The rifle we're going to be using tonight is the Browning x -Bolt, which is our new rifle. It's been an instant success in the UK. We've taken fantastic sales and had great reports from the rifle. I've used it myself on many occasions, and tonight hopefully it'll be yet another successful stalk. It's not just the rifle that's important. It's the cartridge you put up it. I have uh, three kinds of bullets. The first one I put in the, the first that I will shoot if I shoot is the XP3, okay? Because it's um, it's a very poly, very polyvalent bullet, okay? If you shoot a muscle, then uh, the, the the mushrooming is not that big. If but if you shoot uh, a bone, the mushrooming is much bigger. So at, you are at least sure that uh, the mushrooming will adapt to the place you uh, you shoot. Okay, that's for the that's for the roe deer. Uh, for the foxes, a pure lead core bullet, something that uh, uh, for which the mushrooming is very big because the foxes, of course, uh, you just want to kill uh, those. Now the third one is the is the ballistic silver tip. Huh? So I used to have an XP3 and ballistic silver tip for the roe deers and uh, the lead uh, for the um, for the foxes. And why is a 270 WSM better than a 270? Uh, it, in Belgium we have a lot of wild boar. Okay, 270 is not powerful enough for wild boar in a driven hunt. Okay, I have shot uh, in the I had in the past a 270 and. Uh, the beast continue to run you do not the stopping power it's it's not sufficient for the wild boar 
we set out and immediately Damien spots deer. They're females, but barking from just inside the edge of the wood indicates a buck is about. He is, and he's a beauty. Damien really wants this one. We change position again and again, sometimes creeping, sometimes nearly running. But the cleverest running going on is by the buck and his harem, because they're giving us the run around. Damien is extremely careful of backstop here. You've got to know where your bullet's going to end up. And Belgium is a crowded country. These bullets are deadly for miles. Not far away is a nuclear power station. Meanwhile, on the other side of the wood, Andy sees signs of deer. Oh, here we go. Three signs of a roebuck. One is where he scraped his territory out. Two, where he's been browsing. Here, on the end of this sycamore tree of some description. And thirdly, there's some fresh um, fraying there. That would have been caused by a young buck this time of year trying to get rid of the velvet and ready for the rut for this year. We follow Christian, the gamekeeper, and he suggests Andy has a look up a high seat. Nice try, but it proves fruitless. As the evening closes in, we sit on the edge of the wood, looking out across farmland. On the other side of the hunting area, Damien is trying to call in foxes. But like with the buck, his luck is down. Just as Andy is about to give up, he stops. What an amazing shot. Yes. 250 yes. yards and he is jubilant. Meters. Fox. Second time in Belgium, second time a fox at that distance. We try to look for the fox, but not too hard for good reason. I was over here with um, Chris from Swillington's last year and we shot a fox um, in a very similar situation to this evening, same sort of distances. And we were quite chuffed and we went to retrieve the fox and all of a sudden everybody in Belgium didn't want to be a friend anymore or ever, sh ever shake hands. And then we realised it was because of um, rabies. Over here, foxes, people wouldn't go anywhere near them, even with a big stick, because of the, the threat of rabies. So, did Andy enjoy his Belgian hunting experience? This evening's gone fairly well. We've, we've had certain things in our favour, but the weather was very good. Unfortunately, the wind wasn't really in our favour, and Christian, the gamekeeper, was very apprehensive at the start, which proved um, his instincts were correct. We didn't see any roe deer at all this evening, or any fleeting roe deer. However, just at the end, we did have a little bit of excitement where we saw a fox who decided to make a dash for it into the woods, but we cut him off at the pass, so to speak. So in true English fashion, we, we have had a, a jolly good evening. We've learnt a lot. The Belgians do stalk somewhat differently to us. They covered a lot more ground. Um, over here, we te over in England, we tend to walk a little and watch a lot. It would seem here that they tend to walk a lot and watch a little. But as in Rome, do as the Romans do. So no doubt the X-Bolt launched last year is a great handling rifle. We put in a request to Browning to see what other rifles they have in R&D. Absolutely no. I said before, no. The highlights for Martin was meeting the men who worked on his stock and carried out his engraving. A hundred years ago, the streets of Liège echoed to the tap-tap of the engraver's hammers. Beauty is not just skin deep with a browning. Here's how really to buff up your barrels. Back at his home in Yorkshire, Martin is a keen member of a pub clay shooting team. He reckons he shoots up to 15,000 shells a year. Last stop on our trip to Belgium is a clay ground at a gorgeous Belgian chateau where there are lots of toys to play with. So which toy for which kind of kid? Well, we've come here today and we've tested the uh, three types of shotgun, the semi-auto, the new Maxus, 
which has taken the country by storm. In fact, the world, it starts off in the US and has now spread throughout the whole of Europe. Um, the Heritage, which is the prestige uh, model of the 525 brand, and then the B25, B2G, which is what we saw being made um, yesterday. Well, you can see the very fast sharp shooting of the Maxus on YouTube. But if I'm a kind of basic British shooter, wh which of these three do I need for which situation? If you were a connoisseur of guns and you wanted a handmade gun, you've backed the B25, which you saw being made earlier this week. If you were looking for um, a good, reliable, robust gun that would last you a lifetime, the 525. This Come, one. yep, 525. This is the Heritage, which is our side plate version. Yep. It's the, um, it comes with a 10-year warranty. Nice picture of the partridge. Yeah. And a pheasant. 10-year warranty, and we're the only manufacturer that are proud to offer a three-year warranty on the wood. No one else in the gun industry will offer that sort of warranty. Is this because you trust that bloke you're telling me about out in Uzbekistan? Yep. We are so proud of our product that we're prepared to make that brush statement. We will guarantee that wood for three years. Now, if I buy this, there was a time, of course, if I... If I bought this, I wouldn't get a second invitation for the shooting because it's an over and under, isn't it? But those times have changed. Times have changed and they're not going to go back. Um, to see someone with a side-by-side -side on a shoot now is actually getting rarer and rarer. Because the side-by-side, -side, fantastic guns as they were 100 years ago, they're just not robust enough to, to handle shooting of modern requirements today. But I turn up to a pheasant shooting with this. Well, this is an ongoing problem. If certain places in Europe, Spain and Italy, that would be the gun for partridge and... You would turn up. Yeah, yeah, that would be quite acceptable. It's only the UK where we, we do sort of say, no, enough's enough, we're not going to change that fast. Um, and the semi-auto would not be allowed. But do you think that we will one day? I think it would take at least another 50 years. What, two generations of shooters? Yes. It's a long time. So what kind of shooter am I for this? The Maxus is an ideal gun for somebody who wants a working gun. They, yep. they don't want any frills, they just want something that's fully functional and he's not going to let them down. Yep. You can buy cheaper semi-autos on the market, great. This is something that guarantee will not let you down. So if you're out rabbiting in the, in the middle of the night or you want to go goose shooting on the foreshore, this will take anything from a, a two and three quarter inch cartridge right the way up to a three and a half inch magnum cartridge. So a great big goose load up yep, there. Yep, goose load, shorties. foxes, and you can still use it for clay shooting. And you can drop it over the side of the boat, sink yep. to the bottom and you won't. Steel shot proofed. Um, if it gets dirty or full of mud, you can just wipe it off, wash it off, give it a quick oil afterwards and it will still keep going. Wash it in seawater? I wouldn't recommend washing anything in seawater. <laughs> if you've been anywhere near sea with any gun at all, you must wash it and oil it thoroughly. Right. Martin is going to get hold of his finished gun in the next couple of months. This has been an incredible experience for him, something he's wanted to do all his life. You'd wait forever for one, wouldn't you? Yeah, for what, for what you've always wanted, you'd wait forever, wouldn't you? So, any chance of a shiny new browning for us to take home? I already said no. How many times a day I have to tell you?